Welcome, everybody. We're very excited to have you for this virtual discussion about what makes Portrait of Jenny one of the rarest, if not the rarest cinematic experience you can have. I think a lot of us have been missing being in a theater and having that communal experience. So this will hopefully kind of give you a little bit of that feel feeling. Um, and I just wanna do a couple housekeeping things before I turn it over to our speakers today. Um, so Zoom, we welcome you to use the chat uh, function as some of you are already doing. Very excited someone has a cat named after this film. That's amazing. Um, if you have any questions for our presenters, uh, we're gonna do all of the questions at the end, but you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and that's where you should put your questions. And so we'll one by one address them. Um, we won't be allowing kind of live speaking or live questions at the moment. So make sure you're using that function. Um, if you do have any questions about Zoom itself or having issues, you can put those in the chat and we will get to them. And then we're also going to be having a recording of this. So if at any point you have to run out or something happens to your internet connection or you, I don't know, need to do whatever you need to do, um, we will be sharing this recording within a week. If you're really loving it and you just need to watch it again on repeat, we, we got you covered. Um, so about a week from now, we'll be sending out an e-news that has the recording attached to it. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our amazing presenters. Thank you, Kate. I really appreciate it. Um, so this is our little presentation on Portrait of Jenny. Uh, that we wouldn't have been here had it not been for the Nitrate Picture Show, which sadly we had to postpone until 2021 for its sixth edition. Uh, but we also wouldn't be here if it weren't for people like Kate uh, making this uh, type of uh, event possible where we can reach out to you and actually interact with some information that we have. So uh, I'd like to first introduce uh, myself. I am Jared Case, Curator of Film Exhibitions at the Dryden Theater and the George Eastman Museum. And I uh, am also, or I, I was the uh, director of the Nitrate Picture Show for the uh, first five years of the festival. Uh, also joining us on this call are Anthony Labate, who is the Preservation Manager at the George Eastman Museum. Do you say anything, Anthony? I think that that covers it. <laughs> and Spencer Cristiano, who is the chief projectionist at the George Eastman Museum. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, a little history about the Nitrate Picture Show. Uh, we uh, have had nitrate collections in at the George Eastman Museum for uh, almost uh, set more than 70 years now. And we have had uh, a nitrate vault, state-of-the-art nitrate vault since 1952. Uh, our theater, the Dryden Theater, was built in 1951, uh, so that was the end of the nitrate era for film, which means that it was built to show nitrate film, and we have maintained that ability throughout the 70 years since then, uh, and we now are one of only four venues in the United States that can uh, properly screen nitrate film. So with our collections and with our ability to screen nitrate film, uh, about six years ago, we uh, talked about putting together a festival and really creating an event around nitrate projection, as well as celebration of the nitrate film and that era. So we've got great buy-in from people around the world, not only the archives that are allowing us to screen these films, but also these wonderful people that come from around the world to see these nitrate films screened and uh, to revel in that experience and to talk about and enjoy these films uh, in a festival. So in our first year of the festival, back in 2015, we did about half of the prints from that festival came from our own collection. And one of those was a film called Portrait of Jenny. Now uh, this is a film that uh, was released in 1948, but it really, uh, at the end of the nitrate era, but uh, just before the 1950s when things really shifted, it occupies a really unique place in film history. 
And I think we'd like to uh, talk about what makes this such a special experience, especially when you're seeing it on nitrate film. So I'm going to see if I can resume my share here. We've got some slides to show you. Uh, Anthony, could you uh, go ahead and talk about uh, the plot of Portrait of Jenny before we get into it? Well, uh, the plot is one of the, it's a weird sort of romantic fantasy ghost story in the way. And the film is unusual that it really doesn't have any true opening credits. It begins with a lot of cloud shots, very atmospheric shots of uh, the sky and uh, these glass matte painting shots of New York City, these sort of pretentious quotes from Euripides and Keats and some narration of what is life, what is death. They say you know, time is, you know, the, the past and the future always wrap around us and are there by our sides constantly. So that was unusual for a film of 1948-49. And the only sort of title to the film uh, at the beginning is this uh, title of the actual painting itself that hung, you know, hung in the Metropolitan Museum. So all the main credits really come at the end, which in 1949 was an unusual thing for the film. So it takes place back in 1934 uh, in the, during the Depression. And it's, uh, I think at the time, audiences would have been very familiar with uh, The Ghost of Mrs. Muir, which had come out the year before, where you know, it's like ghost meets girl, ghost loses girl, ghost gets girl, where what, uh, how I think Portrait of Jenny was, put a lot of audiences off on its original release was sort of adult man meets ghost little girl, adult man then meets ghost little girl slightly older, then meets ghost teenage girl, then finally meets ghost adult girl, and then adult man loses adult ghost girl. And there's no real sort of satisfaction in the plot that they get together. It's implied, but it's never really shown. And I think that had something to do with audiences not quite finding their way to this film or on its original release. I think it has certainly gained in the plus 70 years that it's been out a really great following and reputation. I, I love the film. I love how it uses New York City as a, as a character. I love the moody photography. It's, um, it's really a, quite a wonderful film. I agree. I, uh, it's one of those, I, I sort of like my romances like I like my Christmas, with just that little bit of magic that uh, makes it possible for uh, the, the resolution to come. I guess we should say that the plot essentially involves Evan Adams, played by Joseph Cotton, who is a struggling painter. And although he is technically fine, he doesn't seem to have any soul in his art. So when he meets this mysterious young girl, Jenny, Jenny Apple, Apple, Appleton, <laughs> Uh, in the park, uh, not long after he has sold a, a painting for just a, a couple of dollars, um, he he finds this inspiration. Unfortunately, she disappears, and uh, she comes back again and again. And we see that she gets older by using these film techniques, uh, and she has some sense that she knows what's going on, that she's trying to grow up as fast as she can for him. But we get hints that. She is existing in the past for the most part, while Eben is existing in the present. And the story sort of follows that mystery as Eben is trying to figure out who this person is because she has become the, the soul of his art. And it's, she's his muse that he's uh, using to, to create this great art. So he wants to find out about her. He eventually falls in love with her as he goes through these different phases and uh, they, they catch up to each other at the end. Um, but in that same way that these two uh, characters exist in different planes during the, the, the time, um, the Dieterle, William Dieterle, the director, is using techniques that also look back in time to evoke that sense of New York in the teens or, or even films in the teens. So uh, let's, let's talk about some of these techniques that he's using. 
Uh, I know obviously there's soft focus to make Jennifer look a little uh, better, but there's also this technique here, which uh, goes back to, I think you said the 20s. Actually, uh, Eric von Stroheim used it in Blind Husbands with mm. uh, his cinematographer, Ben Reynolds. So that's 1919 where, and they called this at the, that time, they called this technique pastelography where they're trying to make the scenes look like paintings, which is absolutely appropriate for a portrait of Jenny because Joseph Cotton is playing a painter. So it really makes sense that, you know, we'll use this occasionally. It's not, it's usually for just establishing shots here and there. It's only used maybe three times in the film, but it sets a mood. It certainly does. And it, it's thematically connected, the, the fact that they could do that. And it's, it's a technique, not that they pioneered, but that they're looking back on and using from the silent era. Yeah. Um, as I said, the, the film is positioned at a point where it's, clearly out of the silent era, but it's before widescreen really comes into general use. Uh, the last reel of the film is particularly um, inventive in its use uh, of color uh, because it's reflecting back uh, onto coloring techniques that were used primarily in the silent period, uh, including uh, tinting. And uh, I, I know that when we think of older films, particularly films that have been preserved and, and not correctly, uh, we think of them as black and white. Uh, silent films, we have to always remind people, silent films were not black and white, they weren't silent, and they weren't sped up to look like everybody is moving in fast motion. You know, the, there was more subtlety and, and uh, thought that went into it than just that. So can you talk about some of the uh, silent film coloring techniques that we'll see later in the film? So, um, yeah, after the, you know, the black and white portion begins, we go into that last reel to enhance the mood of it. Uh, I, we go to this green tint. So the film is printed on green tinted sonochrome stock, which Kodak introduced in 1929 for sound films. So they could, could still do tinting into the sound, into, onto sound films. And this really, I think, is perfect for the storm. It's, you know, uh, in uh, Boston Harbor. Uh, so the green fits, it's creepy. So it, again, establishing a mood. And so, and then from there, it goes to uh, tone scene, uh, which in the aftermath of the storm goes to the sapia tone, which uh, I think, is, it's very pleasing. It's also very calming. And I think, and this is where uh, thematically Eben finds peace in his life. Uh, even though everything was what has just happened with the storm, he knows he will be okay. He knows probably he'll be reunited with Jenny. So I think this uh, is a really nice calming color and it's used perfectly uh, for to convey that. And these were coloring techniques that, like you said, were very popular in the silent era, not only to replicate actual like yellow for sunlight, but uh, there also was to enhance mood. And it does, these techniques do continue into the sound era with less and less frequency. Uh, tinting, it's funny, as color film production increases, uh, in like the early 30s with uh, sound and musicals. Tinting also increases exponentially with that. So there are about as many tinted films as there are actual technical films. And then in the late 30s, when three color uh, starts to come in, MGM comes out with a new toning process that they introduced with The Good Earth, which proved very popular. Audiences loved it. Uh, one of the things though with it was that you needed uranium for this process. And in the mid forties, the government restricted all civilian use of uranium because of the atomic uh, bomb project. So it kind of fades, uh, literally goes off the screen for a couple of years, uh, this toning process. But in 47, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. uses it on the exile. And then you start to see tone films come back. And this is because I think that most Films now are more films have been going in color, and this is a way to make films a little more pleasing for audiences that that don't have the budget for Technicolor. 
So a lot of low budget Westerns use sepia toning into the 50s. But here, this is certainly, this budget is not an issue on this movie. So this is used really to invoke mood. And I think it's very successful. I mean, Portrait of Jenny is one of 23 films released between 1948 and 49 that employ tinting and toning to some effect. Uh, Tyrone Powers 1948 film The Luck of the Irish all the sequences in Ireland are on tinted green stock so it's something audiences were familiar with at the time uh, but it is not as nearly as prevalent in sound films as it was back in the silent era the use of artificial color right so I was actually going to tell you I was going to ask you a sequence of questions mm -hmm. so to try to establish the rarity of this sort of intersection of, of color techniques. So how often was tinting used? And we'll, we'll just talk about American films right now, so we won't talk about the world releases. And we'll talk about American fiction films, so we're not talking about uh, newsreels and stuff like that. How often was tinting used in the silent period? In the silent period, at its height, which was probably the early 20s, about 90% of films used tinting to some degree or, or another. As film stocks got better, as lenses got better, uh, the black and white photography was becoming so pleasing that it falls off. It doesn't completely go away, but um, it starts to decrease. And then with sound coming in, you have sonochrome, but it's only, we're talking about maybe 10 to 20 films a year at its height in the early 30s are employing tinting of some sort. It's, it's certainly something audiences were f very familiar with, because it's also in shorts, it is in newsreels, it's in cartoons that uh, tinting is employed. And then when MGM introduces the toning process in 37, a lot of films between 37 and like 42 are using toning and sometimes they'll use uh, sonochrome tinted stock and they'll tone that to give a two color effect. Right, yeah. So hey, hey I, I'm, you guys, sorry for for interrupting real quick, uh, Anthony. It sounds like there's there's a beeping sound um, when you're talking in the background. Is there uh, any uh, electronics or anything going on, a fan or anything that might there be? There is a fan in the in the background that uh, it's part of. I think our alarm system out here at the conservation center that I can't do anything about. Uh, okay, <laughs> all right. I, I will do when I. Uh, it's only when I'm talking, unfortunately, because I can uh, mute myself when I'm not. Yeah, it's, it's it's only when you're 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 uh, yeah when you're talking, and then when Jared's talking, it's going away. But that's okay. I just wanted to if if we can't do anything about it, we can't do anything about it. That's all right. So following up on the tinting question, I want to ask the same about toning in the silent era. Uh, toning was used um, probably not as much as tinting, but it was used in conjunction with it, so you get the two right. color effect as well. But uh, toning because it's a more chemical, it's a chemical process that required a little more work is probably not as used as much, but it's uh, just as effective. So it, it was probably about 70% of films probably employed toning of some sort at one point in, in, their, in their running time. And so you're, al you're already getting ahead of me. You're, you're leading into my next question. How many, uh, what a percentage wise would use both tinting and toning? Uh, <laughs> 30, 30%? Yeah. And how many do you know of in the sound era that use both tinting and toning? Probably about at least 20 that I know of that would use both. And they're usually, those are in the 1938, 37, 38 to about 1941 time period. Uh, where they combine the two in a shot. I mean, Portrait of Jenny uses them as separate. So you have a tinted sequence and you have a tone sequence, but where they're combined for a two color effect. Right. So maybe about uh, 20, 20 films did that. Yeah, so just establishing the rarity, we've, we've gotten down from 90% of tinting uh, down to 20 films in this sort of 20 to 25 year period of the sound where uh, they've used both tinting and toning. And how many of those have used uh, a Technicolor shot as well? With tinting and toning? Yeah. You know of one. 
<laughs> yeah, there's definitely no portrait of Jenny. Uh, and I really, I can't think of, off the top of my head, I can't think of any that has also a Technicolor sequence. I could think of films that have Technicolor sequences in black and white, uh, but not with all three. So, so the rarity of the color uh, sort of explicated. Uh, seeing it on nitrate stock, certainly one of only four places in the United States where you can do that. But in addition to that, we've got another technical aspect where Dieterle was looking back to the past. And that is in this same reel that has the uh, color techniques in it, it also changes aspect ratio. And this was uh, a, a technique that, uh, it was, what was it called? And, and explain how it worked uh, in, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, so in the in the 40s, well, it it's a, a technique that goes back to the 20s mm. and was experimented with a little in, I think, like 1924 and 25. But in 1926, Paramount comes out with um, what they call Magnuscope. And they used it for the first time on a James Cruz film called Old Ironsides about the USS Constitution. And at the end of the first part, just before intermission, when the ship is first seen, the screen opens up wide. And so the, you would have your normal standard, you know, 133 screen. And then for these sequences, they'd start to undo the masking and the screen would literally grow, usually getting wider and a little taller to fill out the Prasini march. So some, um, People think that it was just uh, just enlarging it completely into a square, which wouldn't work because most theaters had a very large balcony and anybody sitting in the back of the orchestra, the top of the screen would have been cut off by the overhang of the balcony. So it really was just a widening process. And it was followed up by Chang and Wings in 1927. Uh, and it was a very popular technique. And then when uh, talkies were hitting, they were also coming out with actual really uh, wide wide format films, you know, 65 millimeter, 63.5, uh, I think like natural vision was, and 70 millimeter with grandeur. So everybody was widescreen conscious for a while, even though like the actual wide films didn't do well, people liked this effect. And they said it always would generate oohs and ahs when it was done properly. So you have these relatively small screens in the in the silent era, which are probably about like uh, like twelve feet by eighteen feet uh, ratio, expanding out to like triple the size. So it really was uh, quite the moment. And that technique continued even after the all the the actual wide film systems failed, and uh, they were just going back to regular thirty five millimeter film. Theaters would continue to use this for impact for certain sequences. And it was at the discretion of the theater and the projectionist of what they thought would work. Um, and, you know, so you could see a film completely 137 to 1 in a, one theater and then go to another theater and have sequences, you know, blown up uh, to fill the Puccini march uh, at, an, at another venue. So that, that continued on more than we think into the early 40s. I know, um, I think the Stanley Theater in Philadelphia was showing the aerial sequences from the 1941 film Dive Bomber on a widescreen. And how, Magnuscope specifically, how is this effect achieved? And from there, you can actually go into different ways that they widen the screen uh, as we've talked about in the past. So I think Magnuscope had a zoom lens that they would just start to turn and increase to widen the film and then the masking along the sides of the screen would open up and then when that sequence was over they would just start to reverse that process where they would undo the zoom and bring in the the curtains again for portrait of jenny it's very clever because the screen goes completely black with just that green lightning bolt so you can start to open up the screen and it's just almost imperceptible that anything is happening and then it just slowly widens out gets wider and wider and then the clouds start and then by the time you see that shot of Joseph Cotton in the boat that you're now engulfed in this storm. Um, so 
we've got uh, a film in the si sound era that uses tinting and toning and this wonderful uh, tech three strip technicolor shot. Uh, and also it changes aspect ratio. And what we did at the first nitrate picture show was show this on screen in a nitrate print. So as, as we figure it, this is probably the rarest cinematic experience you can find is one of these uh, prints that has everything in there and projected in the best possible print in the best possible way closest to the original aspect. Yeah, so uh, how did we do this? Uh, this is uh, where I'm going to uh, talk to Spencer Cristiano a little bit, uh, who is up in the booth of the Dryden Theater. So you get a little behind the scenes peek at uh, that space and, and what he does up there. Uh, Anthony is actually at our nitrate vaults out in Chai Lai. Uh, so we've got all our different uh, bases covered here. Uh, Spencer, why don't you talk a little bit about nitrate projection in general and uh, how we need to have multiple people in the booth? Sure. Um, so uh, again, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so we're one of very few uh, projection booths in the United States that can still legally project nitrate. There might be some that are uh, doing it under the radar. We don't know. Um, I hope not, um, but uh, we take uh, nitrate projection very seriously. Uh, the word nitrate is um, a pretty scary word in some circles because it is a highly flammable uh, print source, a uh, very uh, highly flammable um, film stuff. Um, it's actually so flammable that uh, when it ignites, it cannot be extinguished. Um, it burns underwater. It actually oxidizes itself. Um, so we take it really seriously. Um, we take a lot of safety precautions, but one of the things that uh, we do when we're projecting nitrate is we actually use projectors that were designed for the projection of nitrate film. Um, so I'm up here in the Dryden projection booth. I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour of our Century Model C projector. Um, you'll notice these doors on the projector for the upper and lower magazine. Um, so what these do is they actually uh, keep the film enclosed in the entire film path um, from the upper magazine to the image head here where you'll see the uh, lens, the gate, the trap, um, all the way down through the sound head um, and down to the lower magazine. Um, the purpose of this is that if the film were to ignite, we would hope that the uh, flames would be, um, would be contained. Um, we've never tested this. We hope that we never have to test it, um, but it's there if we need it. Um, but our main goal is to prevent the film from igniting in the first place. So there's a lot of safety measures in the projector them, uh, in the projectors themselves. Um, there's a fire safety shutter that drops into place, uh, blocking off the uh, extreme light from the lamp house uh, if the motor is to stop for any reason. Um, we have three projectionists in the booth during all nitrate screening so that there's one person always with their attention on the machine while the film, while the film is running through that active projector ready to close the dowser, stop the motor, bring up the house lights um, in the event of a film tear, a film break, or any kind of emergency that happens in the, uh, in the projector itself. Um, we also have uh, these steel shutters um, that are able to drop down in place of the uh, port windows that are all wired to one single point in the booth. Um, and we're able to drop all of those shutters in front of the port windows all at once, they're uh, gravity powered and they, they work really well. Um, I demonstrate, but it's very, it's a very loud process and uh, it takes a lot of time to reset, um, but it works great. Um, so those are some of the, just a few of the mechanisms of actually projecting nitrate film. Um, when we get into projecting portrait of Jay, did I, answer, did I cover everything, Jared? There, there's one other thing uh, I wanted to bring up, and you haven't said anything about changeover and the fact that uh, we need three people in the booth because we've got one on each projector and a runner. So right. uh, people even familiar with regular uh, safety film projection might be familiar with uh, not changeover, so the, the bladder process. Uh, so can you talk just a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so you'll see this one century projector here, but if you look over to the other side, you'll see another century projector. Um, that's not just uh, because we like the projector so much we bought two of them. Um, <laughs> it's because we do changeover projection in the Dryden booth. 
Um, you'll also, uh, one more thing about nitrate film, uh, nitrate film is that you'll see our water cooling system here, uh, which actually runs coolant through the gates of the projectors themselves uh, to prevent heat from building up in the gate. For change of projection, real to real projection, we actually use two projectors for the screening. So if you come to see a movie at the drive -in theater, you're seeing two projectors in use throughout the entire screen. Um, and the reason that we do this is because, well, film comes on reels and it comes on multiple reels. Um, in Portrait of Jenny's case, I believe it was a, a nine reeler. Anthony, maybe you can uh, confirm that. I think that was a nine reeler with 10 minute reels. Um, so there are some projection booths that utilize a process known as platter projection, where they take each individual reel of film and they splice them together to make one enormous reel of film that is um, fed off of a giant uh, metal platter and runs through one single projector. Um, that's not the best archival practice, and we are a film archive, first and foremost. Um, it's a little less gentle on the film, so we utilize reel-to-reel -reel projection, which means that each reel gets projected individually on, on a projector. So in order to have a seamless transition every 10 or 20 minutes when we, have, when we get to the end of a reel and have to start a new reel, um, we do what's known as a changeover between projectors. So, if you see a movie in the Dryden, you'll occasionally see these little cue marks at the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, sometimes they can be white circles or red splashes or black dots. Um, in the case of the Technicolor era, there were starbursts, which were a uh, giant purple and uh, purple and purple stars with green outlines, um, which are really hard to miss. Um, and that's signaling to the projectionist to literally change over the image and audio from one projector to another. So in, in Portrait of Jenny, when we get to the end of reel seven, um, the, the third to last reel, we change over to reel eight um, to another projector. And while that eighth reel is going through the projector, through one projector, we're actually preparing the next projector to uh, to run the last reel of the film, which has the um, the color shift, the the tinted and toning, um, and most importantly for projection, the aspect ratio change. Um, so, for the, did I answer all of your questions about changeover? I just wanted to establish that okay. because going into that last reel, it was going to be very important for what you're doing. Gotcha. So, yeah. So, um, and if you have any questions about projection, anything that I'm saying, please uh, write it down in the Q&A and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so while the second to last reel is running through one projector, we're preparing the next uh, projector for the final reel with all of those, with all those shifts. Um, we have a, uh, so firstly, I would say that um, from a projection standpoint, the most important change is the change in aspect ratio, the magnavision. Um, if you were to see this movie in 1948, you would probably see it um, projected with a zoom lens. So the projectionist would actually turn the lens, rotate the lens to uh, change the level of magnification on the screen. Um, we don't have zoom lenses in the Dryden Theater, but the 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio is a highly normalized aspect ratio, and we show lots of movies in that aspect. It's one of the most common aspect ratios for modern filmmaking. So we do have a 1.85 to 1 lens. We do have a 1.85 a 1.85 to 1 aperture plate, and our projectors are totally prepared to project that aspect ratio. So instead of using a zoom lens, we just switch out our lenses and our aperture plate. So our aperture plates are little pieces of metal that actually shape the uh, light that passes through the lamp house uh, and is permitted to pass through to the film. I'll hold this up to the, uh, the camera here a little bit. So this is a 1.85 to 1 aperture, and I'm going to compare this with a 1.37 to 1 aperture. 1.37 to 1. And if I hold these up next to each other, you can see just how different that aspect ratio is. If we move our 1.85 to 1 aperture plate, you can see just how much of the image it's actually cutting off. So the aperture plate goes in the projector uh, between the light source and the film itself. So I'm going to bring our camera over here and see if I can demonstrate that real quick. We'll get a nice close-up of our um, 
of our center projector here. So you can see our threading window up here, which projectionist uses to keep the film in frame, and then our actual image aperture down here. If I insert the aperture down here, you can see just how much is getting cut off. So the film would be going in these tracks to the left and right, and we're actually cutting off that light from passing through the film. So in practice, what we're doing is we're actually just cropping the image that is on the film. Thirty-five millimeter film is a constant size. All thirty-five millimeter film is thirty-five millimeters. Um, so we're cropping the top and bottom of the printed image with portrait of Jenny, rather than projecting a brand new aspect, or rather than um, uh, using a different size of film. Um, so Portrait of Jenny actually is printed 1.37 to 1, which is very nearly square, um, all the way through the print. So if you didn't have a 1.85 to 1 uh, lens or aperture plate, you could still show the entire movie in that single aspect ratio. It just wouldn't be as cool. Um, so in practice, when we're projecting uh, Portrait of Jenny, we're switching out our aperture plates. We're also switching out our lenses. So we have... Um, because we're a film archive, because we, we take this seriously, we have a different lens and a different aperture plate for every aspect ratio that we are here to project. So we've got our 1.37 to 1 lens, we've got our 1.85 to 1 lens, so we would switch these out in the mounts in the projectors um, while that second to last reel is going through the active projector. And since nitrate reels are pretty short, we have to do all of this in about 10 minutes. Um, and that also includes um, threading the reel um, through the projector. Um, it involves cleaning the projector because we clean the projector after every reel of film runs through it um, so that we don't pass any dirt or debris from one reel to another. Um, and so that we don't get any scratches on the film or any, or, um, any damage on the film. So it's a, it's a pretty intensive process, um, but we, uh, we, we managed to pull it off, I think. Um, and then finally, when we actually hit the screen, uh, with the last reel, when we actually switch to that final, uh, to that, that 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio, we also have to move our masking, our left and right masking out. Um, because if you look through our port window, you'll see our masking is currently set up for 1.371, to which is a very nearly square aspect ratio. We have our masking controls over here. And on our AMX panel, we actually have uh, presets for all of our common aspect ratios. So when we activate 1.3701, when we, when we uh, switch over from that, uh, from that active projector to our final reel, we would just activate our 1.851 preset. And you can see that our uh, left and right masking are going to start moving automatically. Um, it wouldn't be that noticeable in, uh, during a screening because you'd actually be seeing the lightning storm. You, uh, most of the screen is dark during that segment. Um, yeah, OK. <laughs> OK. Ah, OK. Well, it doesn't appear to be working right now. So this is why we rehearse things. There we go. OK. Now we've got our, our masking working. We've always got a backup in place. Um, so you probably wouldn't notice the mask moving that much because you've got a very dark screen. Um, and one of the one of the things that I thought was most was really cool about Portrait of Jenny was that because the image is so dark during that storm, it's a very smooth transition from one aspect ratio to another. It's almost as if once the image sort of stabilizes, um, everything you're just suddenly in this more encompassing, um, uh, more more. Uh, a kind of more of an intimate aspect ratio. Um, we're also switching film stocks. So since we have, uh, we're going from a black and white stock to a uh, tinted and toned stock, we also have a, to adjust our focus for that glass reel. Um, because the film will have a different thickness, that means that that film has a different focal point. So in addition to all of that, as soon as we hit the screen with that last reel, the projectionist is rapidly trying to focus the lens on a thunderstorm, um, which is easier said than done. Um, and I, I think that's it. 
as far as the 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 intricate process of uh, of projecting those last couple of reels, Jared, am I missing anything? Uh, I've got one thing that might be unclear. Just as you were showing the aperture plates, uh, and the uh, one eight five was shorter than the one three seven, and yet Correct. what we end up with is a, a an image just as tall but wider. So if you could talk about the importance of the lenses without getting into too much. Sure. So for our 1.37 to 1 lens, the, the lens that we would use for the majority of that print, it requires a lower level of magnification than the lens that we use for the final reel, the 1.85 to 1 lens. Um, that's because we're using almost the entire real estate of the, uh, the image on the film when we're projecting in the first aspect ratio, and then we're cropping the top and bottom of the frame for the second aspect ratio. So that requires a greater level of magnification to really fill up the, uh, not only the horizontal real estate of the screen, but the vertical real estate of the screen. It's possible to project different aspect ratios using one lens. You can just switch out different aperture plates. But the problem with that is that it's kind of like letterboxing or pillar boxing on your TV. You'll get black bars at the top and bottom of your screen. And we would get the same thing on our screen in the drive. So in order to maximize the use of our beautiful screen, we have to use different lenses with different levels of magnification. Um, by the way, if anyone's interested in learning more about projection, um, I think I might lose my job if I don't take this opportunity to plug the Art of Film Projection that we get inside, um, which is uh, a comprehensive outline of the materials, equipment, and knowledge needed to present the magic of cinema to an audience. It has a foreword by Tacita Dean and Christopher Nolan. Um, it is co-authored and co-edited by yours truly. Um, and it can be purchased through Artbook PAP, the George Eastman Museum gift shop, and on Amazon.com. And it's available at a very reasonable price. <laughs> it is very reasonable with all the work that went into it and as gorgeous as that looks. A lot of work went into the book. <laughs> uh, so um, considering that uh, we have in the past and what we were planning on doing this year at the Nitrate Picture Show, shown a nitrate print of a film that has tinting, toning, and uh, a three-strip technicolor shot and goes through an aspect ratio change at the end in that final reel. I think we've made the case uh, with all of your uh, professional support in the booth that this is the most unique cinematic experience that uh, you can find. And uh, we do hope to bring this film to you at the Nitrate Picture Show next year. So please consider signing up uh, once we have the go-ahead to go ahead and do that. And uh, we hope to see you uh, then. At this point, uh, I would love to open it up for questions. So Kate or Nick, if you've got any to share. Anthony or Spencer, do you have questions for each other? <laughs> I saw somebody had uh, in the chat asked how many, how, how much were the wattage, what was the wattage of the bulbs in the projectors? Oh, the wattage. Um, I believe we're using, I think we're using 4,000 watt lamps. I'm not positive. It might be a little bit less than that. Um, I can, if, if you send me an email, I can, I can look that up for you. We, we've, been, we've been closed for a while, so it's been a while since we've uh, changed a lamp. Yeah. So we did get a few questions. If you could just explain the difference between tinting and toning. Okay, uh, I'll leave that one to Anthony. Right, well, tinting is an overall wash or dye over the entire image where they, they used to originally dip the film into a bath of dye and it would be this overall color. Later, uh, later they came out with pre-tinted stocks where the base of the film was actually a color. So whatever was like black in the image still remained black. With toning, you got a chemical compound that would replace the silver salt or the black parts of the image with a metallic compound of a color, usually sapia. So if it was a sapia, whatever was black in the image was now brown, but the highlights would remain pretty much untouched and stay clearer or very close to clear. Um, another question relating to kind of switching to color. 
Um, do we know how it was perceived during the time? What kind of audiences thought about this switch from black and white to all of a sudden moving to color? Well, I think in by Portrait of Jenny, the, anybody who was 30 years old or older would have seen all this before. Um, from the silent days when they would have black and white films would be tinted and they'd have a technicolor sequence in them. They would be used to seeing films going uh, wide and then back down to a normal aspect ratio. So I think it was just for them, normal. Um, uh, even like films like The Portrait of Dor uh, the Picture of Dorian Gray, which came out in 1945. Anytime, most of the times if you saw the, the picture itself, it was in technicolor. So that was a technique that they were used to. I think for us today, it is perceived as unusual because we don't have every, we don't have that cinematic going experience that they do. So we're used to like films were black and white or they were in color. You didn't have all these in between steps that most moviegoers would have experienced, as uh, adult film goers would have experienced, and they would have liked it. They, I think they, it was just like that. Not only were they used to it, they did enjoy it. And again, I would say that thematically that technique supports the narrative at that point in the film where he's going, he's finally meeting up with uh, Jenny in this storm that's nobody has seen coming except for him because it happened in the past. And suddenly you're going from this somewhat reality based to this sort of crossover of times where uh, these two people are coming together, fated to meet in this uh, geographic place, but at some sort of weird uh, time in between. So. I think that helps too. Great, uh, so this one is a question more for Spencer. So what kind of notes would accompany the film reels so the projectionist would know what the aspect ratio and changes would be? Um, uh, before I get to that, um, I did just look up the, the wattage for our lamps on our, uh, on our film projectors. They're 2000 watts. Um, I think we use 4,000 watts for our Barco uh, digital cinema projector. Um, so it's not uncommon for uh, notes to the projectionist to come in uh, in film cans. Um, that's a little less common now that film distribution is more rare. Um, uh, Stanley Kubrick is a notable example who put uh, notes for, for very famous notes for Bear, uh, Barry Lyndon. Um, I, so I, I don't have um, hard evidence that there would be notes, like a, a sheet of paper in the film cans for Portrait of Jenny for a projectionist to use. Um, maybe somebody out there has made a scan of that, um, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if there was um, a note saying, this print is Magnavision. Um, it should be projected using a zoom lens at the end of, uh, at the end of Real 8. And I can add to that, Spencer, specifically in the case of Portrait of Jenny, uh, I think Anthony has done research that there were very few uh, venues that were actually using Magnascope at the time. Most of the time it was just presented at 137, right, Anthony? True, but I mean, most of the theaters that were showing it probably still had Magnascope screens and lenses left over from the late 20s, early 30s. So the capability was certainly still there. And I know Selznick certainly wanted this done. So he was probably sending out notes with instructions where if you can do this effect, uh, do it. And it was really, it's noted in all the uh, reviews of where it was done at first. Uh, in Los Angeles, they did it. In New York, they did it. And I know that was mentioned. So I would imagine that if the theaters could do it, they did. Mm -hmm. Great, we got a couple of questions that are along the lines of, if you can't watch this in a theater, gasp, I know. If you can't watch it in the theater, what's the best way to watch it? Is there a version that actually shows changes in the size? What would be the best way to see this? Jared, do you want to take it? Or it's like, <laughs> I, because uh, what I did was, um, about 10 years ago, I, I got my first flat screen TV. I was watching the DVD of Portrait of Jenny and there's that wide button on there so you could go to switch the aspect ratio. So I was like, I wonder if it would work. So I hit the <laughs> wide button and it worked. 
So I physically, at that point, changed the aspect ratio on my TV. But the DVD is not set up that way at all, or the, the Blu-ray isn't either. Right, and I, if the DVD is out of print, is the Blu-ray out of print as well, do you know? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it is. Yeah, and it's, the Blu-ray it's, was made from our print, from the nitrate print. Right. It's, it's very difficult, but they do have the uh, color changes in those uh, transfers, if I remember. Yeah, they do. Um, it's very difficult to recommend home viewing for something where you want to have the best experience because there's so many different variables. Uh, when you're talking about the communication from your disc player to your TV and the different settings that your TV has. And then we've had experiences where studios want to release something on DVD or Blu-ray that doesn't represent the original, but it is maximized for effect on a digital screen as opposed to uh, on film. So it, seeing it the, the right way, it, this is why we do this. This is our mission to maintain the cinematic experience and get it as close as possible to the original experience. Uh, seeing it on film is the best way. Uh, anything other than that, you're, you're sort of taking a risk, although um, the, the color does exist in the digital transfers and that's, I guess, as close as you can get as long as you like the way that your uh, disc and TV are set up with the display. So there's a few questions that are asking about with projection, when do things go wrong? <laughs> um, never. <laughs> they never go wrong at the Dryden. Well, um, I would say that when things go wrong in the Dryden, the audience rarely knows about it. Um, we do a, a pretty good, well, things don't often go wrong in, in the Dryden because we, we are very extensive in our pre-projection work. Um, we run regular preventive maintenance on our projection equipment. Um, we uh, thoroughly inspect each reel of film before we run it through a projector. Um, we repair all damage that is, uh, all damage on a print before we run it through a projector. Um, we routinely run tests of our equipment. Um, so all of that work goes goes pretty far um, in reducing the number of, um, uh, we call them showstoppers, um, uh, uh, instances in which we have to actually stop projection um, to correct something. Um, those don't happen too often, um, but I won't say that they're impossible, um, and I won't say that they never happen. Um, I guess um, one of the great, one of the great things about having a passionate team of projectionists here is that um, we take the job very seriously. And um, there's a there's a sort of a stereotype about projectionists that has grown particularly in the, I would say maybe 70s and beyond that projectionists are people who push buttons and then they read a book in the corner. Um, and that is not what we do here. Um, we're we're spending our time when we're not running from one projector to another, when we're not rewinding film, when we're not cutting the next film, when we're not monitoring focus, monitoring framing, monitoring the masking, um, monitoring the volume levels. We're watching the, we're physically watching the film as it goes through a projector. Um, and there's a magic to that. Um, you can't, you, you just don't get that when you're watching a, a DVD or a Blu-ray at home. Um, so if something does go wrong, we, we, we notice it really quickly. Um, I would say that projectionists use all of their senses, um, with the exception of taste, um, when they're, when they're, uh, projecting and, uh, you kind of train your ears so that when I'm rewinding a film on the other side of the booth, um, I can hear the chatter of the film going through the projector, and I know if something sounds just a little bit off. We have some more questions, Kate? Yes, we do. Um, we have 48 questions. Oh boy. So we are definitely not going to get to everybody's questions, um, but people are more than welcome to kind of continue conversations later and we can follow up with things in the e-news as well mm -hmm. after the fact. 
Uh, so we got a question about the cinematographers. So Joe August and Lee Garms were credited as cinematographers, but someone had said that Stanley Cortez was also involved. Do we know about the cinematographers for this film? I know Joseph August gets credit on the film. I don't know if Lee Garms does. Uh, there was another one. I, it's not Stanley Cortez. There was uh, another one who I think did like the miniature photography on it. But mm. Joseph August died while shooting the film. Uh, he had a heart attack on the set. Uh, and then Lee Garms took over from, uh, from him on that. Uh, this was a really troubled production. It was... It started shooting in late March in 1947 in New York City on location. They shut it down about a month later because Selznick was micromanaging, wasn't, didn't like the script, wasn't happy with the way the film was looking. So the, um, they stopped location shooting, brought it back to Hollywood. They finished actual photography somewhere in around October 1948. So it was in production for about a year and a half. And I... I would imagine, I know uh, Selznick did use uh, Stanley Cortez, so it wouldn't be surprising that he didn't come in at one point or another in that year and a half that this film was being made. And that's an incredible amount of time to spend on a film at that time period. So yeah. Those films were like four, four months in production. Um, we have a few questions that are along the lines of, you know, because there's the change in aspect ratio, were theaters not interested in screening this film or did they cut corners when screening it? Um, so do we know if kind of people were scared off of projecting the film? Well, I mean, the entire film is printed in the 1.37 to one aspect ratio. So even if you don't have that special widescreen aperture plate or that special zoom lens, you can still show the entire movie um, from beginning to end. It would just use a, it would just uh, skip the aspect ratio. Um, there is a type of uh, widescreen printing process called hard matting in which um, instead of cropping the top and bottom of the film frame with the aperture plate, but you still use that aperture plate but the actual image is printed widescreen. Um, so there's really no, um, no leeway or, or room for interpretation with uh, framing up or down. Um, that was not being used at this period um, in, in projection history. Great, so we're just gonna do one last question. Okay. That'll be it for today. So this is a very important question. Spencer, could you repeat the title of the book? <laughs> what, you mean this book? Yes, that book. It is the Art of Film Projection, A Beginner's Guide, and it is beautifully illustrated with a ribbon, um, and it's available at Amazon, the George Eastman Museum gift shop, and uh, at Artbook DAP, and I highly recommend it. And I just shared a link as well. If people are interested in purchasing it, you can also get to it from um, our website. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this really fascinating and unique discussion. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we are going to be sharing it. So when you want to watch it again next week, we'll be there for you so you can check it out. Um, we will follow up and hopefully get to some of your questions as well that we didn't get to answer today. Thank you all so much for coming and for all your amazing questions. And thank you to our amazing speakers. Uh, I'm sure we'd all be clapping if we could hear everybody. Uh, and we hope to see you all again soon, hopefully in person next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much for joining in.